day, three hours of broadcast excellence, 800-282-2882. The email address, ilrushbo at eibnet.us. Now, before we get into the serious rough and tumble of American politics and the things going on with the issues of the day, there's some relatively lighthearted things. Although there's nothing lighthearted anymore. I mean, I've got a story here. Students, college students, believe that violence is warranted if you say something they don't like. Violence is warranted. College students, violence is, in fact, not only warranted, violence is indicated. Violence is required to shut people up saying things you don't want to hear. It's a big story in the Washington Post last night, and I was reading about it, and I ran into a couple of, uh, you know, pompous, arrogant leftists. And these people all think that they're smarter than everybody else and cooler and hipper and, and all that. And it's just grating. You can, you can just... You can just sense the arrogance and, and the, the conceit as well as the condescension when you read these people. But one of these leftists that I was very, very worried about this, because this is, he said it was, it, it's, it's insane, it's silly, and what it's going to lead to, it, it's, it's going to lead to uh, a shutdown of legitimate dissent. Because if college students believe that it's okay to start beating up people simply saying things you don't want to hear, then in order to maintain order and in order to maintain civility, the authorities are going to have to stop protests. And if that were to happen, if the left were denied the opportunity to protest, one thing that would happen from that is the national mood would increase by 100%. Imagine if you could turn on the TV for a week and not see a bunch of malcontents running around, blowing up things, causing havoc, protesting, hating the country. Imagine the improvement in your mood. And this, this it may lead to that. I mean, if, if uh, even, even some drive-bys are nervous about this, because the, the protest, a uh, public protest dissent, uh, the protest march, it is a fundamental element of advancing liberalism by virtue of the intimidation and the chaos and the disruption of order that is involved. And so even some leftists think that this has gone too far. You want to hear something really odd. And the extremes to which liberalism now is going when there are no guardrails and when there are no controls, when there are no boundaries. Listen to this. France, the nation of France. You see this? The, the nation of France is going to make wolf whistling and asking women for their phone number a criminal offense. Surveys show that virtually all French women have been harassed on the bus, on the subway, in taxi cab, wherever you find public transportation, women are subject to harassment in the street or elsewhere at some time, and it happens every day. Did you know this? That women are harassed every day, asking a woman for her phone number, a criminal offense, and if a woman happens to walk by a construction project, there's some plumbers there, you know, with, with the butt crack showing when they bend over, and then they wolf whistle at her, they might end up in jail. This is from the, uh, what's it, the UK Sun. Uh, wolf whistling is set to be banned in France as the government declares war on men hassling women in public. Under new plans, bugging women for their telephone numbers and following them could also be prohibited. The crackdown comes after surveys show virtually all French women have been harassed on public uh, transport in the street or elsewhere at, uh, at, at some time. Uh, only a few countries, including Belgium and Portugal, have banned such behavior. I didn't know. Did you know that you... Yeah, I, I wasn't aware that Belgium and Portugal have banned such behavior. The UK and others have broader laws against harassment in general, but none so specific. Now, some lawyers believe men should only be prosecuted when police officers witness an offense. 
Others say that women should be able to file criminal lawsuits against offending wolf whistlers and offending requests for phone numbers. Marlene Schiappa, Undersecretary for Gender Equality. Undersecretary for Gender Equality defended the plan, gave an example of behavior that would be illegal. She said, okay, so you are a woman in an underground train. I am a man. I follow you. You get off the train. I get off. You get on another train. I get on too. I ask you for your phone number. I ask again. I ask a third time. You feel oppressed. That is street harassment. Well, yeah, that's stalking. I totally understand that, but somebody in a, you ask for a woman for her phone number, I guess it doesn't include at bars, does it? It just, it says public transport here. Uh, and the example the undersecretary for gender equality gives is a subway circumstance, a subway scenario. I imagine everybody knows if you're in a bar, you're in there for one or two reasons. You're in there to consume adult beverages and to hook up. And or. Uh, and so asking for a phone number might be crucial in a bar. And they might be willing to look the other way. But I, I don't know if the wolf whistle would be exempted in the bar. Uh, well, I, there, there's, no, there's no similar criminal behavior for women when they approach men. I, I, women apparently the only victims of this. They are not perps. So women can stalk and oppress and ask for phone numbers, which is good because the guys would love that. Uh, and, of course, women, they don't whistle at men, but, I mean, you know. You know, a guy knows when a woman's interested. I mean, and a guy knows when a woman is not. I mean, when a woman's interested, wild horses won't stop her. If she is not interested, there isn't any amount of money or anything else that will make her so. Guys instinctively know this. But there's no no reciprocal. I mean, women apparently are not capable of behaving in this criminal fashion. Um, a lawyer in France accused the undersecretary for gender equality, Marlene Schappe, accused her of seeking to outlaw heavy Latin chat-up lines. <laughs> This guy's name is uh, William Goldnadel, and he said, this is an assault on Latinos. This is how we operate, and women love us. The swarthy, dark look, women love us, especially fair-skinned women. They fantasize about us, and to have, have this go, this is crazy to say that we can't ask for the phone number. He said the only consequences of the law would be to enrich feminist lawyers and to clog up the court system. Well, that, that is true. No question about that. One-fifth of college students say violence against controversial speakers is acceptable. Senate GOP reaches a tentative deal for a 10-year, $1.5 trillion tax cut. We have details coming up on um, uh, Trump's approval number is up now to 43 percent in a couple of places. He's rebounding. Drive-bys are aghast. The drive-bys in general are aghast at Trump's speech yesterday. They're calling it dark and foreboding, much like they called his inaugural speech. They're terribly upset. The Paul Manafort situation is continuing to unfold. Manafort has uh, kind of thrown down the gauntlet at Mueller and said, look, I got nothing to hide. Release what you took out of my house. Make it public. You got nothing. Let everybody know what you got. Talk about harassment. It is clear what's going on with Mueller, which takes me to the first soundbite. I just want to play this for you because it's an echo. It is a Limbaugh echo. I have been pointing this out since Trump was elected. I've probably been pointing out so many times that many of you probably, when I get into it, it's, come on, come on, we've heard it, we got it, move on. But here's the echo. It happened last night on Fox News. Michael Caputo was on, and uh, he was asked about this effort of Mueller and the special counsel investigation and what it all means. And here is the Limbaugh echo.
I'm not quite certain they're going to beat President Trump and the people around President Trump, but I believe that that is their purpose. I think the establishment that's been entrenched in Washington for so very, very long on both sides of the aisle, they can't have another Donald Trump pop up in 10 years, another billionaire populist who wants to make things right in Washington. So they have to punish Donald Trump, his family, destroy his businesses, his friends, where I guess I fit in and others, and just to make sure that this never happens again. Folks, I cannot tell you how correct that is. I, I can't. That that is, that is n- almost one hundred percent of the motivation behind the Mueller investigation, the deep state leaks on supposed collusion between Trump and Russia. All of this is aimed at destroying Donald Trump and everybody with him to send the signal to others who might be thinking of trying it, like Kid Rock. Don't even think about it, because we will destroy you, too. I have, I've tried to uh, come up with various analogies to further explain and be persuasive on, on how this is actually structured and what it is, searching for ways to explain just how elite and distant and removed from the rest of the country the washington establishment is it does it does comprise people of all parties not just both but all parties it's made up of people who have certain university pedigrees uh they are in certain vocations and it is a very exclusive very arrogant uh, uh, organization it, it does not have membership. There's not a manual that, that uh, contains the names of everybody who's a member. You know or, whether you're a member or not. Uh, there's not a single figurehead leader of the establishment. It's more a way of life and a way of thinking. And there is no amount of uh, achievement, no amount of success that can get you into it. It totally is dependent on your education, your, your uh, uh, family. It, it depends on, on much with your, your background and what you're trained to do uh, and, your, and your way of thinking. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's the most exclusive club in the country. And they have been rocked. They, they, uh, the establishment has been in charge, in control, and running things for longer than you would believe. And it gets away with disguising itself by having two political parties that appear to be at war with each other. And they make a pretty good show of it. There are some differences in the part. I mean, the, the, the establishment's not all f- friends. They're not all like-minded. They're not all... Um, going to backyard barbecues together. But even those who are on the outs politically, say Republicans, uh, not part of the mainstream media apparatus, not not part of the uh, dominant liberal culture, they nevertheless are members, and they value that, and they treasure it, and they will put their remaining membership, staying a member of the establishment, above anything else, winning elections, uh, finding certain kinds of employment. It's, it's a, it really is a close and tight-knit group. It's relatively small when you compare it to the entire population of the country, but it is where all of the power and the wealth is actually concentrated. Now, there are a lot of wealthy people not part of it, like Trump, but it's, one of the, it's, it's, it's the power center and the power structure of the country. There are people live in California that are in the Washington establishment. There are people in, uh, in New York that are part of it. Very few, but they're there. And the attitude is they are better than everybody else. They are special simply by virtue of membership in this club. They are special in ways that nobody can replicate. You cannot. You cannot be the people they are because you don't come from the people they come from. I mean, it's that exclusive. You can't just, you can't grow up having no knowledge of the establishment and end up going to school at Harvard and doing well and automatically end up in the establishment. It's doable. Of course, it's been done, but it's not automatic. And as I say, there's no initiation ceremony. There's no clubhouse. 
It's an attitude, it's an aura, and it, 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 the attitude is one of total superiority, supremacy, knowledge, power. They're better and they know it than everybody else. It doesn't matter how dumb or stupid they are. These are the people ruining everything, by the way. These are the people that got us $20 trillion in debt and the people that voted for them in large part. I mean, you can't exempt uh, the dependent class totally from this, but you get, you get my drift. And Trump will never, ever, no matter what, he never, ever will be admitted to this, it, no matter what he does, no matter what he says, no matter how many friends he makes that are in the estate, it will never happen. They can't permit it. If somebody like Trump is permitted in the establishment and is an acknowledged member of it, then there goes the establishment. Everything they have used to keep people out will have blown to smithereens. He can't become a member of it, and he shouldn't even try or want to, because the things he would have to do to convince them he's worthy would mean betraying everybody that elected him. And he's not going to do that. But Caputo here is more right than he knows. This is the Mueller investigation. 17 investigators, all Clintonites or Obamaites, they're looking at Trump business affairs 10 and 15 years ago. And I will guarantee you they're looking at Trump's tax returns that have been made public and that $900 million tax deduction. If they can wipe Trump out with IRS penalties and taxes, they will do it, folks. If they can wipe him out, they won't care. They have no compassion. There's nothing humanitarian about this group. Once if, they, if they can wipe him out, they will. To send the message to everybody else, don't even try it. I got to take a break. We'll be back. We'll continue after this. Nothing to worry about until next week, if it keeps happening. Uh, but that's for later. Grab audio sound bites uh, 14 and 15 yesterday on, at 15 first. Uh, wait a minute now. Da, 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 da. No, nope, got to go 14 first. I thought 15 was years ago, but it's not. Uh, Hillary was on NPR Fresh Air yesterday afternoon, and the conversation of the host was Terry Gross. And uh, she said that she might contest the election. I mean, it's, 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 it's lunatic. But here's what she said. Would you completely rule out questioning the legitimacy of this election if we learn that the Russian interference in the election is even deeper than we know now? No, I would not. I would say... You're not going to rule it out? No, I wouldn't rule it out. This woman, folks, is not all there. Obviously, she's not on her book tour, her excuse tour, which is embarrassing. Everybody, have you noticed the number of drive-bys and Democrats publicly saying, Hillary, pack it in. Hillary, take it somewhere where we can't see it. Stop it. You're not going to be the president. You're not going to be a nominee again. Stop it. You're hurting us. You're causing us big problems. We need a new face. We need a new body. We need a new hairdo. We need everything new. We can't have you continue. To sh this is being said in a number of places. So that was yesterday during the day. Last night, she went on Colbert's show. And uh, so what do you mean questioning the legitimacy of the election? There's no constitutional mechanism to question the election. What are you talking about? So, as I say in the book, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, nobody's talking about contesting the election, including me. But I do think, no, because there is no mechanism. Wait a minute. Earlier in the day, she told the NPR audience that she was considering contesting, even if... There is no way, no matter what would be judged about the election, that she's going to be president. And if she's harboring that illusion, then it's better than we even thought that the woman lost. I mean, this is dangerous, dangerous psychological territory, and we are bearing witness to it here. It's a, um, it's a sad day for the, for the Limbaugh family. Um, my Aunt Anne passed away very early this morning, natural causes, a, uh, a long illness. She's the uh, wife of my Uncle Steve. They lived in St. Louis. Uh, he was, until his retirement, a uh, district court, federal district court judge, Eastern District of Missouri. His son, my cousin, is now that federal judge. But Anne was, uh, w w when I turned 16, big deal, get your driver's license. You know what was 
you know what what became it I became the official Limbaugh family deliverer of meals on wheels she insisted on it and I would go to my mother what is this I you do what Ann says okay so I'm delivering meals on wheels I'd never heard of it I'm 16 years of age she was the point of that is that she was charitable to a fault she was selfless and she didn't suffer fools and in her family she didn't permit them <laughs> it was just a force of nature and she was always been so supportive of me uh, even even when it was challenging to uh, to do so she uh, she had a full life uh, she was one of the the grand dames of the of the family uh, a, a genuine matriarch and she's going to be sorely sorely missed she and her husband uncle steve married well over 50 years and it's uh, these things happen you know it's 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 one of the i've always said that i look forward to getting older and the day has not yet come where i regret that every year so far has been better than the day before but the older you get um, death is something that's more frequent and more common among your family your circle of friends and so forth it's unavoidable obviously but she was um, just a, a just a great great lady with uh, impeccable uh, taste and a wonderful personality always smiling and she was inspirational to uh, everybody who knew her and Limbo. And I, 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 I had to mention this because I consider all of you part of uh, an extended family. And I have, the, I have the great opportunity here for all of you to know, to a certain extent, members of my family. We're very proud of each other. Um, and so it's a it's a opportunity for me and I, I appreciate your indulgence while mentioning this um, Trump's approval rating as I mentioned is ticking back up this is not supposed to happen Trump's approval numbers are supposed to stay down and continue downward once the drive-bys think that they are making this happen but it's not the approval rating ticking upward following his response to the hurricanes. Have you seen any news about that, by the way, folks? Have you seen a story? Have you seen a single story this week about the federal government's behavior and competence and response to Hurricanes Harvey and Irma? You haven't, have you? Why do you think that is? Why do you think you haven't, you haven't seen a story on how well things are going? You haven't seen, here in Florida, I can tell you that Florida Power and Light is so far ahead of schedule in, in, uh, in, in restoring power. I mean, we got it back in four days when we were originally told it could be many weeks. Uh, some people were told the power plant servicing them was seriously damaged and it could be months. But I think... Over 75% of the people have lost power, have had it restored. Uh, I mean, it's, it's still a disaster in many places, but some of the flooded areas, say in Miami, the uh, floodwaters have receded faster than uh, the media suggested would be the case. But it, it, it fascinated me because there's not a single story about this. And what that must mean what that must mean is that Trump and the administration are doing a bang-up job with this. And so are the Republican governors in Texas and in Florida. Because I'm here to tell you, if there were any problems, if there were people being left out, if things weren't being improved and improved rapidly, then the drive-bys would be all over it and you'd be reading about it. And there would be columns and there would be stories and there would be panel discussions on the incompetence of Donald Trump. He just doesn't know these things, they would say. He just doesn't have the experience, they would say, of dealing with a bureaucracy like this. And apparently... 
Donald Trump has real world experience at building a lot of things and rebuilding a lot of things and dealing with disasters like this. And the very absence of any news about this is the truth and the indication. So Trump's approval numbers are ticking up in large part because of the the uh, aftermath from the uh, from the hurricanes and the U.N. speech. I guarantee you when they start polling on the opinion, approval opinion of, uh, of Trump after that U.N. speech yesterday, it's going to skyrocket. Well, I shouldn't say skyrocket, but it's it's going to trickle up. It's going to move up after that speech yesterday. And the disconnect on that is breathtaking to behold. You listen to people in the aforementioned establishment, and you can do that by watching anybody in the drive-by media, and they think it was embarrassing. Trump overall is embarrassing. His speech was embarrassing. Ooh, it embarrassed us, say the drive-bys. It embarrassed us, say the members of the establishment. And they want to immediately reach out to their diplomatic brethren in other countries and apologize and say, please don't hold it against us. We didn't elect him and we don't support him. Please, please do not think he's speaking for us. But yet... The Soviet foreign minister praised the speech as one of the greatest of all time that he's heard. And, you know, Trump, we, we play the audio sound bites of this, Trump just literally savaged socialism in that speech yesterday. And in his example, he cited Venezuela. He savaged what so he said. He said socialism is, in fact, he said the successful implementation of socialism is exactly why so many nations are failing. He said it's not the unsuccessful implementation, it's the highly successful. Now, if you missed our morning update today, you know, there is literal mass starvation in Venezuela. Now, stop and think of this for a moment. Venezuela, before Hugo Chavez, used to be a fairly decent place to live, and it was a fairly decent upticking economy, and it was rooted and based in oil. They are an oil-rich nation. Hello, Hugo Chavez, avowed socialist, gets elected, succeeded by his hand-picked fellow socialist, Nicolas Maduro, and now literal, I'm, this is not just a term being tossed around, literal mass starvation. Do you know what Maduro is suggesting that Venezuelan citizens do? He is suggesting rabbits. He said, rabbits are not pets. Rabbits are not cute. Rabbits are five pound chunks of protein. And he is encouraging Venezuelan citizens to capture and cook rabbits as a way of dealing with mass starvation. So anyway, the Venezuelan representative, the United Nations, shows up to respond to Trump's speech yesterday, and he said unknowingly, I mean, I'm, it's another indication about out of step all these people on the left are, what was that? What was that? Was that Ronald Reagan brought back to life? Is that, what, can we have to listen to Ronald Reagan again? Damn right, Mr. Ambassador, damn right that's what it was, but he thought it was a great insult to call Trump Reagan. You know, Reagan was an avowed anti-socialist and anti-communist and also didn't, didn't care much for, for Hugo Chavez. People like him. So here's this ambassador ripping Trump as being an incarnation of Reagan, not knowing that well over half the country is hearing it and applauding it. So Trump's approval number is ticking up, and it is based on performance. It is not based on buzz. It's not based on PR. It's not based on spin. It's not based on the media singing Trump's praises because they're doing the exact opposite. Trump's approval number up from the mid-30s now to 43%, and it's based solely on performance, making a sufficient number of calls. And it, you know, you might think it's no big deal, but people were on hold here for an hour and a half and didn't make it on the program. And I feel badly about that. So I have vowed to try to make amends for it a little bit today. So we're going to start. I'm not ready to go to the phones, but I'm going to use discipline here. Um, as we were talking about yesterday, discipline, self-reliance, staying on a, 
uh, straight and narrow, working hard, all these things that uh, the left says is now white supremacy. What would I talk about if I wasn't? Uh, well, uh, next up is the, the, uh, the drive-bys saying, yeah, Trump insists on America first, but who's going to follow him? Um, it's a piece, the Associated Press. I got a pretty big section here on Manafort to get into in terms of what's really going on. And this is this is a gigantic. This is this the Manafort, the Mueller investigation. More and more people that I trust are calling this a giant cover up of the real scandal, the Hillary email scandal and all of this. You know, even after the election, Obama said it's technologically impossible for the Russians to affect our elections. It just he said it before the election, said it afterwards. But shortly after he said that, 24 hours later, the Hillary camp starts blaming Russia. Then we got the Trump dossier and this whole thing. We got unmasking of, uh, of Flynn and Manafort and others. And it's, it's beginning since there hasn't been any evidence of anything here. People are now beginning to, people I trust, are beginning to think that this whole thing is what I just said it is. It's an effort to destroy Trump and his business especially his to wipe him out and anybody associated with him as the biggest lesson outsiders could be taught don't try this again and at the same time the real scandal that Comey and everybody abruptly stopped and now this is the cover-up for is the Hillary Clinton email scandal and the Hillary Clinton Hoover of do you know, sucking up dollars from all over the world for her foundation before she was president. Selling access. Uh, those are the things that uh, I'm, I'm talking about legal and intelligence professionals who have been paying attention to as we all have. But there's nothing there. Now, this, this, this pre-dawn raid picking the lock. Manafort's house and now Manafort, release what you found. I got nothing to hide. I didn't do anything. And uh, I, I don't doubt for a minute what whatever this is. I know it's an effort to destroy Trump. And I, I don't mean just destroy him reputationally. They are going to try to wipe him out, folks. That's what this all is. And everybody associated with him. And Caputo said it on Fox last night, one of his uh, warriors, close associates. The real cover-up is what was going on with Clinton's and Hillary and her email and and that that cannot be permitted to be uncovered. That's how the establishment does stuff. And we're never to know. We are never to know that stuff. And we already know too much. And if you want to stay in the establishment, you're going to partake. Comey, you like being among us? Fine. Here's what's going to happen. Loretta Lynch, you want to you want to hang on, have your reputation not destroyed? This is what you're going to do. But that's what I would have talked about. And see, I just did. I set the table for further discussion and still have time to be true to my discipline and commitment to get started on the phone. So we're going to Beaverton, Oregon. Mary, you're first. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Rush. Very much appreciate it. Um, you did a brilliant job just now of laying out a number of issues that we should be investigating right now. Uh, Jeff Sessions, could you by any chance pick up a courtesy telephone and start doing your job? What is your complaint? Well, he appears to have recused himself of everything but immigration, every part of the job. What have we learned since July 5th, Rush, about the investigation, the FBI investigation of Hillary Clinton? Well. I, I said July 5th we needed a special in a prosecutor to investigate the investigation. It's only gotten how much, how many more, how much more data has come out since then? Then we've got the unmasking. We, you listed a bunch of them, Rush. Let me ask you a question. What's he doing? Does he know that the Department of Justice reports to him? And lest we forget, two weeks ago, do you remember the FBI's response when they refused to turn over any more information about the Clinton email investigation? Yeah, they said we didn't think anybody cared. And that's under Jeff Sessions' Department of Justice. Well, what is going on? And you know still what? A, wait, wait, no, I understand the beef. It is the Jeff Sessions DOJ. It's actually the Trump DOJ. Uh, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But I am, I am now led to two conclusions, one of two conclusions. I just want to— either completely I, incompetent. I, I, I mean I, completely I, incompetent. Or, God forbid, <laughs> J.F. Comey and the boys have something to, on him, and he knows I'm it. I'm told that offends women. Uh, 
I want to ask you a question before time expires here. Are you there? Testing, hello. I have I'm here. Okay. Were you offended by my wolf whistle? Uh, no. Okay. It, it's going to take a lot more than that to offend me, Rush. What about if I ask you for your phone number, even though we already have it here because of caller ID? Well, you already have it, so no. <laughs> I had a quote. Were you happened? Did you happen to see Fox News last night? Greg Jarrett, who was I one read his op-ed yesterday. Yes, I, I was. I was standing up and cheering. Greg Jarrett thinks that Sessions should resign for incompetence. And I, th I wondered if you had seen that as a, as a, you know, some of the ammo that's in your call here. Rush, when that op-ed was published, I, I woke up to a number of emails because my friends know how I feel about this. And they said, this guy just read every point you've been making. He just wrote it out. He hit it out of the park with that. Where are you, Jeff Sessions? He needs to understand something. If people cannot trust the Department of Justice, and I have zero trust for them right now, the corruption is rife, up and down. Right. If we can't trust that, Rush... Kiss democracy goodbye. Why? No, no, ditto. Absolutely. DOJ is supposed to be exactly what it is, the Department of Justice. Well, look, uh, Mary, I appreciate the phone call. I'm, I'm going to have to react to this uh, later. I'm out of time here in this brief segment, but I'm glad, and I applaud your ability to say what you had to say briefly and concisely. Very good. We'll be back. Here we Clinton had the Clinton Global Initiative, which was a, an intended babe magnet thing, uh, and, a, and a fundraising effort disguised as a charitable outfit. And now Obama's doing this. It's amazing when the world gathers in New York on UN week, uh, it attracts a lot of people. And Obama's making a speech at some organization called Goalkeepers. Cookie, I don't need any sound bites from it. I just want to tell you one thing he said and the reaction to it, which I was surprised. Now, he's, he's got a friendly audience there. Uh, I don't know what Goalkeepers is, but I could guess. It's not hockey. It's probably about living a solid life, meeting and uh, uh, making goals and sticking to it, achieving them, accomplishing them, uh, even if it is the government supporting you. But Obama said that we live in times that everybody seems to be upset by. Everybody's on edge. Everybody's nervous. And he said he used to tell his staff in the White House all the time, and his family, that that was a silly outlook, that there was every reason in the world to be optimistic. No reaction from the crowd at all. Normally, optimism is an applause line. No reaction at all. And then I think he was expecting some reaction, didn't get so he went on. And he said, I know, I know, it may sound strange to you, but I firmly believe it. He said, if you look at America today, it's better than at any time in our history. It's better than 50 years ago. It's better than it was 30 years ago. No applause, none. Dead silence. Here a pin drop. It's better than it was 20 years ago. America's even better today than it was 10 years ago. Still, no audience reaction whatsoever. Normally, that kind of a, a line or making that kind of a point, I'll guarantee you, if I ever am somewhere and it's, it's if, if I have made a public appearance or a speech, and if I'm talking about such things, and I talk about optimism, and I talk about America and the opportunity that's still here and the, uh, the threshold for greatness for those who want us, it always, it always gets loud applause. And in some cases, a standing O. I, if I may say, it's almost an automatic go-to if you need to get the audience out of their seats. Start talking about the greatness of America and start talking about the future and make comparisons, America today to 50 years ago. Now, he didn't specify how. He didn't say economically, culturally, or any of that. What I found fascinating was that there wasn't a single, that I could hear anyway, round of applause on any of it. So I got to thinking, who are the people at this thing, gatekeeper, goalkeepers, and obviously with Obama as the 
keynote speaker, a lot of Obamaites there. And I don't think these people want to hear optimism. I don't think they want to hear that things are better in America today than they were 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Even if people don't believe it, they will applaud the premise, is my, because they want it to be true. And they're comforted by somebody who thinks it. If the speaker is uh, credible and has believability, and if the speaker has a, uh, a bond with the audience, the speaker says, I believe it. I believe our best days are ahead. This country is doing better today than it was 20 years ago, 30 years. In some areas, you could make the case. It's not even arguable. It always gets applause because even if people don't think it, they want it to be. But this crowd didn't make a sound. And Obama clearly expected them to. You can see. No, my point is that there's a bunch of probable leftist Democrats in that crowd, and they don't want to hear anything uplifting, and they don't want to hear anything. They, they want to have their negativism and their anger reinforced. And maybe he will later on in the speech. Um, I, 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 he's, he's, he's blasting the Republicans trying to undo Obamacare, and he'll no doubt blast Trump for what he said about the Iran deal. But in that just little segment that I saw, I found that fascinating. Because as I say, those are automatic applause lines. If you, Well, I don't know. I haven't seen the crowd. But yet when, when Obama cracked a joke, they laughed. When he cracked a joke about how he doesn't look his age, he's much older than he is, and they, they laughed at that. So there's people there. Yeah. I also, I got an email during the break. Rush, about your aunt who passed away, your Aunt Anne, was she supportive of you even during the war? Worst time, yes. Folks, that's the, uh, that's the thing about, I'm sure it's your family too, but, but uh, in, in my family, I've, and believe me, <laughs> I've tested them. Um, they are a, my, my family are typical Americans. They're, they're head down, steam ahead. Uh, they're not into anything for public adulation, recognition of any kind, and, and, and yet, uh, they've always been supportive. Anne used to write me notes constantly, encouraging me, uh, applauding me. She, she listened every day, and if she heard me say something she thought was especially poignant or smart, she would, she'd fire off a note and tell me. Those kinds of things are invaluable. Uh, getting support like that. And she did that with everybody in the family. She was funny as she could be. She, her husband and her son became onophiles. You know what an onophile is? That's a wine aficionado. And they, they, uh, they have their wine club and they would have monthly dinners and tastings of the, the best wines they could get a hold of. And Amber would just give me the cheap stuff so I can put some ice in it. Like like my mother. My dad bought a Cadillac once. My mother refused to be seen driving it. She'd ride in the thing, but she didn't want to be seen. She didn't want town to get the wrong idea. And Anne was the same way. Give me that cheap stuff. So I can put some ice in it and nobody will complain. Always the cheap white wine. She drank the good stuff, but she always... And she never... You know, I'm 66... Uh, one of her one of her grandkids got married. Stephen the Third got married in Arizona this summer, and I don't care. I'm 66, but I will. I was always a nephew. And you re, you were you knew it. You were the nephew, and you still hadn't grown. And to her, I was rusty. Never, it didn't change. That's what I was growing up, and that's what I was always going to be. And she'd tell me that. Your dad was rush, and your grandfather was rush. You're rush. It, it was all lighthearted and good fun. But she. She, um, she, she always reminded you that she was the aunt and you were the nephew uh, in, a, in a funny and, and humorous, humorous way. But, folks, the supportive, uh, well, the support that I've had from all of my family throughout all of this has never wavered. And she was right there at the... At the uh, top of it, leading the, leading the effort. 
I'm going to miss her tremendously because she was, as most people are, she was she was one of a kind. Uh, she was confident. Um, the older I get, the more that impresses me in people as a really valuable attitude. Genuine confidence is often the thing that opens doors, the coupled with, uh, with desire. But yeah, she was constantly supportive. Uh, I tell you what, let me take a break on that, and, and we'll come back here and we'll, we'll resume with the rest of the prepped show. I do want to spend some time on this study of American college students. 20% of them think it's not only okay, violence is required to fight offensive speech anywhere, on campus, anywhere. It's required. Now, where are they being taught this stuff? It's the Bill and Melinda Gates inaugural Goalkeepers. It's an event dedicated to accelerating world progress. Of course it is. Mosquito nets for everybody. Accelerating world progress. Other speakers include Bill and Melinda Gates, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, Will I Am from the Purple People. What's, in the, what's that group? Black Eyed Peas, right? Then uh, uh, Malala and Stephen Fry, who's the British comedian. Those are some of the heralded speakers. And Obama is the keynote. Now, look, one of the reasons Obama is singing the virtues of America is because he wants to be seen as responsible for it. No, he's, I mean, he's got to go out there and, and make it look like everything's great because he was president. And his, uh, his great legacy and uh, and all of that so i understand that but still it's a common thing for for uh, public speakers public officials to say to, to to speak about the greatness and the optimism that that exists and how america's better today than it's ever been and so forth but the problem with that is that's not what people see in the media the media rips this country to shreds every which way but sunday from sunday and particularly when Republicans hold power, the media does nothing but beat the hell out of this country. And people can't escape it. They're inundated by it. They're pounded with it each and every day. Uh, and it's, it's part and parcel of the, of the plan to defeat Republicans. And the media then focuses on the misery and the suffering and the hurting that's going on. There was something, there was something I saw and I, I printed it out and I hope I made a copy of it it was it was somebody talking about all the hurting going on and it just struck me why who thinks this way and I'm doing a, a, a bad job of previewing it because I don't remember who said it and what the context was but I think I saved it and I'll find it and this whole notion that so many people think life is enduring the suffering and pain and that everybody's hurting and those are things you have power over in some ways. You don't have to suffer. Not all the time. Suffering doesn't have to be a way of life. Hurting does not have to be a way of life. But it's easy. It's part of victimology. Um, it's easier than thinking optimistically. Let me get back to the phones. Where are we going to start here, uh, Mr. Snurdly? Well, that would be Fred in Cleveland. Fred, I'm glad you called. You're up next. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Rush. I hope you're doing great as well. Thank you, sir. I am. Okay, I have two quick points. Uh, the first thing, you were talking about Hillary. I believe that uh, as more comes out and the more unmasking and what have you, she's going to be turned on by the Democrats because she's going to be so poisonous. She's going to be the most hated woman in America in six months. Well, she's already the most cheated on woman in America, so you're probably... <laughs> well, well, that goes without saying. <laughs> but my second point, I think that the 2018 elections are going to be another runaway for the Republicans. The Ameri there are two forces on this planet that cannot be beaten. One is Mother Nature. We see it every day. And the second is the American people. The American people in 2018, if the Senate needs 
64 votes, the American people are going to give them 70. If the Congress needs 52 votes, the American people are going to give them 58. No. So that a year from now, we no one can say, hey, why isn't anything getting done? The American people will show again in 2018 who holds the power in this country. Fred, that's I a, guarantee it. That's a, that's a very, very powerful thought that you have and a very, very powerful prognostication. Now, the only question I have for you is for all of that to happen, people would have to vote Republican. And a lot of people are very, very mad at Republicans right now because they are not doing what you say that they will do. They are not advancing the agenda. Now, the Senate's working on health care, and uh, Lindsey Graham says, hey, we're going to get 50 votes for this. We're going to get it. And they've, they've entered a trillion-and-a-half tax cut, tax reform plan uh, as well. But up to now, they have been studiously avoiding, seriously avoiding, doing anything to help advance the Trump agenda. And I have been of the opinion if they don't get a grip on things, they could lose the House. Not, not because people are going to vote for Democrats. People don't like the Democrats either. The, the reason Republicans have been winning is to re Donald Trump and people are fed up with Democrats. But it's not that people have been voting for Republicans because Republicans have not been honest. They've been promising and not delivering. And as long as the Democrats continue to be more disgusting and disliked, then Republicans or Republicans are going to win. But it need not be this way. It could be the way you're describing if they would just for three months, try to get some of this stuff done. It would be, it would be, nobody would have ever seen anything like it if they would, for three months, just try, I, be serious I, about it. I agree, I agree, Rush. I think the American people are too smart. I don't think the Republicans could lose in 18, even if they try. This isn't about Republican Democrat. This is about giving Trump the power to push this country forward. And if Paul Ryan won't do it, if McConnell won't do it, then the American people will put f five more Tea Party guys in there or five more conservatives on the other side in there. You know what I mean? What, what can we do? Say, no, we're not going to vote, and then let some loser Democrats squeak by? We will force the Republicans to win, and we will force them to do what Trump wants to do. Well, Fred, I appreciate the call, and I very, very much appreciate your sentiment there, and I hope that there's something to it. Um, I am of a similar thinking on the, on the 2018 midterms. There's two schools of thought out there. W when you talk to seasoned political professionals, seasoned political scientists and analysts and think tankers and so forth, and one school of thought, and really this is not analysis, this is desire. There's one school of thought that says the country hates Trump. The country realizes what a mistake they made, and they want adult leadership back. But what they want most of all is to have somebody to make sure Trump doesn't succeed. And, of course, that to them means the Democrats are going to win big and maybe even take back the House. The other point of view is closer here to what Fred said, but for, I mean, different reasons. And it is rooted in the fact that the Democrat Party is in the tank and doesn't know it. And even if they do know it, they're not doing anything to help themselves. With Hillary Clinton front and center, that's, that's nothing but a negative and a drag on the party. And the same thing with Crazy Bernie. And you might think, Crazy Bernie, they love crazy. Do they? You look where Crazy Bernie campaigned. Kimberly Strassel made this point. You look where Crazy Bernie campaigned in all these states that Trump, you know, they say he just won by 40,000 votes or 70,000. If 70,000 votes had changed, it's always a Democrat lament. Lament. Uh, 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 lament. Uh, John Kerry, after 2000, if we'd have just won 55,000 votes in Ohio, I'd be afraid. Yeah, but you didn't. And 55,000 is not an insignificant number. It's not a you know, close election of 55,000 votes. But they're saying uh, that Crazy Bernie is the future of the party because the party's bring far left. But Crazy Bernie didn't. You know, outside of his own campaign, he had no coattails for anybody. Crazy Bernie didn't bring out anybody. Now, Crazy Bernie's voters 
were very angry at Hillary because Hillary had rigged the election against Crazy Bernie. But even at that, Crazy Bernie couldn't cause coattails. Uh, he's not the Joe Biden's not the answer. Democrats, history is outside of Obama. They are losing elections, and there's there's nothing changing on that. Trump is the is the wild card in the equation, and he's ticking upward right now. I think it looks bad for them, no matter what. No longer need a whole bunch of wires to connect things in your house. That's a big deal, folks. Without wires, you don't have to rip out walls. You don't have to hide the wires. You have to run them along the baseboards, base wall, paint them white, make sure they blend. None of that. You don't need wires anymore. And that means you don't need experts coming out doing a site survey in your house to determine and tell you the best place to put this element and that element. You decide all of that now. And you know how? It's very simple. You simply go to the places in your house where you think somebody could break in. Where are those? Doors and windows. Imagine how easy that is. And then you decide, you know, that window up there is in the second floor. It's in an attic. There's nobody going to, I don't need to put a sensor up there. You can, but I don't need whether nobody's going to put a ladder up there and go in that house and in that window. You pick the windows and doors that you want to protect and you order sensors from Simply Safe. And those sensors show up, they've been pre-tested and configured, and you take the stick them off the back and you put them on there. And you do that in all the doors and other entryways that you think are vulnerable. And then you decide, you know what, I wanna have some motion sensors in here, but I wanna put them in a certain place where the cats, the dogs, the pets are not gonna screw anything up. So you figure out where you want those. And then if you want sensors that detect breaking glass, you know, put them near a window. Um, to have double protection, you have a sensor there. Then maybe you want some HD cameras so that when you're not home, you can monitor the inside of your home to see what's going on. You can do all that yourself now. And it's just as effective, it's just as good as the guys that come out and do a site survey and run wires. And if there's a sensor that's bad, the app on your phone will tell you. In an easily understandable way, it'll say sensor at whatever window that you label it. So you know what it is, not the company. I, you know, I've, seen, I've been in houses with security systems and they say there's a fault at window here and that part. I don't know where it is. I don't know what, it's always in shorthand because the display on the pad is not very big. So there can't be a whole lot of information on it. You determine what the names of all these locations are so you know if, some, if a sensor goes bad or reports a fault. All of this you can do inside of an hour and you have a home security system that's as effective as anything out there and there's a base station that comes at the base station where all these sensors report to so if there's a violation this base station causes a gigantic siren to go off inside and outside the house if you want and if you want that base station to then report to the authorities if you want monitoring if you want the cops and the fire department to be notified when one of those sensors is tripped you can do that but there again 14.99 a month 15 bucks a month no contract do it or not it's up to you and cancel it anytime there's no two-year contract it isn't fifty dollars a month this is the simply safe system and it was uh, the mother of invention uh, made this possible guy who lived in an apartment in college the landlord would not put a security system in the guy had valuable things in there so he invented a security system for his apartment and now that is simply safe the website simply safeusa.com no harm in looking that's the website simplysafeusa.com uh, in addition to putting a system together ad hoc like this they have a couple of uh, their most often purchased systems you can see those at best buy if you want to go that route you can do that too but start it all off at simplysafeusa.com now mr snurdly asked me an intriguing pregunta uh, during the bottom of the hour break he wanted to know if i thought La Raza and the leftists showing up to basically shut down Nancy Pelosi's press conference on DACA and the Dreamers. And we played the soundbite for you yesterday. 
and it was brutal. These are people that you would think would love Pelosi and Schumer, Chuck and Nancy, because they're Democrats and they're pro-amnesty, they're pro-immigration, immigration, and yet the Dreamers and the DACA people show up and they shut it down. And they're calling her a liar. And they're saying, you don't believe any of this. And they basically took over her press conference, drove her away from the podium. And I'm, it was a remarkable thing to see. You would expect them to try that uh, at, at a Republican representative town hall. But they did it to Pelosi. Snurdley's question, is this a one-off? Or is there really a split now between some of these militant pro-amnesty immigration groups in the Democrat Party? And I, I don't know yet, but I'll tell you what I think could be happening here. What is the Democrat Party, folks? When you get right down to it, what is it? It has always been a coalition of individual interest groups. You've had big labor. You've had the feminazis. You have had African Americans. You've got the immigration crowd. You've got the gay community and now the trans community. And take any other uh, left wing interest group and they're all on the left and they all vote for the Democrat Party. Now, individually, these groups do not share identical agendas. What is it these groups all have in common? There's one or two things, aside from the special interest nature, like uh, the, the, the pro-amnesty crowd. I mean, they care about immigration and amnesty and, and getting into the country with no penalties and whatever. And in the, the, the militant gay community, they care about gay marriage, gay rights, gay this, bathrooms, trans, all that. And then big labor, they care about whatever they care about. And the African-Americans, they care about what is it that has united this coalition and has made it unified to the point that it routinely and regularly and expectedly votes Democrat. Let me throw one thing else into the mix. Because this, I mention it a lot because I think it's a big deal. In November of 2011, the Obama administration, politically, the Obama campaign made a decision to discard from this coalition white working class voters. Now, a lot of those people are union. A lot of them are actually blue collar, but the political clarification or qualification or description is white working class, which means middle and lower middle class. And the Democrats decided to stop trying to get their support. The Democrats decided that their future was as the unifying clearinghouse for every minority group there is. Minority groups that we know, minority groups we've never heard of, minority groups that are going to be created. Well, no group that's made up of white people can ever be considered a minority. The Democrats thought it would be a problem if they had to have a message that appealed to white working class voters that also appealed to all these other various coalitions, the African Americans, the Hispanics, the gays and lesbians and the trans. So they... They did it via a newspaper column. Uh, one of the accredited columnists, I, I, Ed Thomas B. Edsall, used to be at the Washington Post, now was a, basically a campaign advisor. Democrats wrote the piece, and that was the official announcement in November 2011. The Democrats were casting aside wor white working class voters. Guess who scooped them up, by the way? That would be the Trumpster. Trump scooped them up. The Democrats have lost elections before that. They've lost elections ever since they did that. The one thing that kept them unified, all these different groups, the one thing that kept them unified, and there was more than one, but the one thing that kept them unified was absolute hatred for anybody on the right, be they a Republican, be they conservative, be they libertarian, absolute hatred, raw hatred for us is what unified all of those other groups. And the Democrats 
relied on that and I think took a lot of it for granted. And I think a lot of these groups are beginning to realize that they have been taken for granted. Look at the African-American popular. Look at what the Democrats have promised them and look at what the Democrats have assured them versus what they've gained. And it's not close. And look at the illegal immigration crowd that wants amnesty. Despite the drive-bys, we're not moving in that direction. With Donald Trump as president, fewer and fewer are trying to get in. There is constant talk of building the wall. Um, we are already moving mountains to enforce existing immigration law. It's not moving in the Democrats' direction. With, with the feminazis, it was always abortion. Uh, and hatred for pro-lifers. Well, now what happens? Well, one other thing, the belief in expanding, growing government as the source of all money and power. Those were the two things that unified. But at some point, I always thought that these groups were going to have to start analyzing whether or not all this money that they're donating and all this time is actually worth it. The eight years of Obama did not help African Americans. The eight years of Obama, I mean, we're going backwards on everything. They're going backwards on everything Obama touted. We're trying to repeal and replace Obamacare, and the effort is ongoing. And Trump makes it sound like he's going to get this done at one point or another. So I think it's possible. We don't know yet, but I think it's possible that these groups may be tired. The Democrat Party is the same old faces, and they're old now. And it's the same old assurances, and it's the same old promises. But they're not able to keep them. And so I think some of these groups are getting frustrated with the lack of progress, despite all the money they're donating and all the time they're giving. I mean, look at them. They're protesting. They are rioting, and it isn't changing anything. Nothing is getting better for them as far as they are concerned. And, and who are they relying on to make it all better? The Democrat Party. So while it, with, with, with the immigration crowd, the dreamers that showed up at Pelosi's event, whether that's a one-off or not, time will tell. But I think the Democrats are in more trouble on this score than anybody's willing to acknowledge, because this is a party that's getting older and weaker and smaller. Their fundraising, their fundraising at the national level is so far behind the RNC, it's amazing. And the Republicans, believe me, are not loved and adored by their supporters. They could be making such progress in the face of all this. And it's an opportunity being blown. I really think we had a story yesterday or the day before Somebody positing that we might, because of Trump and because he's got no ideological grounding and he'll go wherever he has to go to succeed, he'll go wherever he has to go in the political spectrum to make something work, get something done. This guy theorized we could be witnessing what nobody ever thought possible, and that is the actual dissolution of the dominance of our politics by two political parties. Now, if that's happening, that's not going to happen overnight either, because there's no third party to replace yet. But what if Trump decided to go that way? What if somebody who has the ability to draw votes and to influence people like Trump does decided to go that way? So we're, we're really in some unknown territory here with a lot of distinct possibilities and the possible evaporation and breakdown of the entire political system that we've all had throughout our whole lives. But the Democrats are in trouble. So are the Republicans, folks. They need not be. The Democrats have no way out of their mess. The only way out of their mess is to lose all these coalitions, which they can't afford to do because that would end the money and the flow. So. This is why it's such a golden opportunity. I look at it and I see it's not being capitalized. 80% of Republicans now approve of Trump in this poll. His overall approving rate, approval rate, 43%, but among Republicans, 80%. Now, Mitch and Paul don't like seeing that. But 
I mean, that, that, that is why. That's all in. That is why they need up. But the establishment is a powerful thing. And I'm telling you, they fear being excommunicated. They fear being ostracized. I am not kidding you. You ask, you, it seems like common sense. They got a Republican president. 80% of the people that elected him love the guy. 80%. There is energy and enthusiasm for his agenda. And see what's happening to Trump. They see what Mueller is doing. They see what the deep state's doing. The real power in Washington, D.C. is in that club, the establishment, the elites, whatever you want to call it. But despite that, and by the way, this number, this 80 percent, that's before the U.N. speech. It's in the Hill.com. President Trump's approval rating ticking upward following his response to two major hurricanes and his bipartisan negotiations with the Democrat leaders. Remember I told you the morning consult poll, Trump voters don't care that he's working with Chuck and Nancy. They love and believe and trust Trump. And if he's got to work with Chuck and Nancy to do his agenda, they're, they're going to support it. There isn't any party loyalty here that's guiding this. But when you get down into the actual voters, 80% of Republicans now approve of Trump. That and the election returns are all anybody needs to begin the enactment of Trump's agenda. Now you say, well, can the, can the establishment ever be brought around? Will the establishment ever know, folks, even if Trump gets a second term? The establishment is going to always think that they've got to get rid of him. They're not even thinking Trump's second term. Right. Let me give you some detail here. This is from the Kimberly Strassel Wall Street Journal column of last week on uh, what really went wrong with Hillary. That was the subject of her piece, what really happened to Hillary. Uh, and it's, it's a series of things the Democrats will not acknowledge. The Democrats, not only are they trying to spread this myth that the, that the Russians tampered and Trump colluded, it's gone on for so long now that they actually believe something of some something of this sort did happen. They they continue to believe the election was stolen from them somehow. They cannot accept that some pig like Trump would actually win. They they, they really can't. It's it's denial like I haven't seen, coupled now with over a year of immersion in a myth that has become reality. And one of the myths that the Democrats have is that uh, you know, if they'd have nominated Crazy Bernie, it would have been a slam dunk. Crazy Bernie was the, the leftist, the proud leftist that the Democrat Party has become. And if he was a nominee, and Ms. Strassel tries to illustrate in her piece that that's not the case. And here is her evidence in Wisconsin. Crazy Bernie campaign for Russ Feingold, who promised a $15 federal minimum wage, an end to trade deals, and free college. Feingold lost to Republican Ron Johnson. And Crazy Bernie's in there campaigning for him because Feingold basically has the Crazy Bernie agenda, free everything. Still lost. In upstate New York, in a white working class district, Crazy Bernie endorsed Zephyr Teachout. Zephyr Teachout railed against bankers and lobbyists. Zephyr Teachout fought fracking and Citizens United, that dreaded Supreme Court case the left hates. And Zephyr Teachout opposed trade. The Republican John Faso beat Ms. Sander, uh, Zephyr Teachout for the open seat by eight percentage points on a promise to kill Dodd-Frank. So another candidate for whom Crazy Bernie was working and endorsed that basically had the Crazy Bernie agenda went down the tubes. An extraordinary 79% of Colorado voters 
said no to a ballot initiative for Colorado Care. That's the state version of Crazy Bernie's universal health care proposal. This is a state that Hillary won, and Crazy Bernie had 79% of voters vote against his idea. The point here is that, it, that if they think Crazy Bernie would have won because he had all these codes, he didn't. His agenda did not have the nationwide support that the Democrats think. In California, Crazy Bernie endorsed and campaigned for Prop 61. Prop 61 was designed to impose prescription drug price controls. It went down to a substantial defeat in California, which Hillary won by 30 points. Another big bomb out by Crazy Bernie. Progressives argue that all they need to elect Bernie or Elizabeth Warren is the right way of pitching their populist policies of free health care, price-controlled drugs, to the white working class. See, crazy Bernie and Elizabeth think it's a big mistake for the Obama crowd, the Hillary crowd, to throw away white working class. They're trying to get them back. This agenda didn't do it. They went for Trump. They haven't been able to sell free health care and price controls on prescription drugs even to bright blue states. Now, she points out here, Republicans have failed to unite or govern or pass their biggest priorities, but the political analysts are setting themselves up for another surprise if they ignore the big reasons the Democrats lost. The Democrats lost on issues. Hillary Clinton lost on a combination of issues and personality. She's just not liked. There's nothing, don't take this the wrong way, but there's nothing attractive. There's nothing attractive about her agenda. There's nothing attractive about her personality. Hillary's whole pitch was, it's my turn. I am owed. I deserve. And she had the hubris to think that a majority of Americans thought so. Yes, Hillary, we do owe you. Yes, Hillary, you deserve to be president because of all of the excrement sandwiches that you have been forced to eat. Yes, Hillary, we feel sorry for you. Yes, Hillary, they didn't think that way at all. She still doesn't get it. AP, Trump insists on America first. Who will follow? Now, let me tell you something about this America first. What do you think Trump means by it? Yeah, 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 he does. But it's not just that. I actually heard Trump explain this. And some, some people in Trump's administration explained this. And I was watching, Fox has this uh, analyst that appears on some of it, Jillian Anderson, or Jillian, I don't, I, there's so many, I, I, she worked in the National Security Council, she's on the staff, I think, for Obama. Okay. And she was talking about this, and she had heard exactly what I heard. And what Trump means by this, America first, also means the UK people being UK first. And in Belgium, Belgium first. Trump's belief is exactly what I said yesterday. Trump believes that if every nation believes in itself rather than believes in being subordinate and subservient to a global organization and the whole world is going to be better with everybody trying to be the best they can be. He doesn't mean put America first over everybody else, but he says compared to the world and global organizations, screw that. I'm going to do what's best for America. And he further explained, I think the Brits ought to do what's best for them. The theory is that in all of the Western democracies and free nations, there's enough commonality that these nations banding together to put themselves first has a lot of commonality. Um, and, and the way it was explained, it made it made sense in this. I remember watching this Jillian. Um, I'm not sure it's Anderson, Jillian Turner. That's what it is. She was saying, when I heard this, it completely changed my view of Trump on this. I, 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 he fleshed this out for me in a way that I had not understood it. 
And she actually became, it sounded like she was supportive of the whole thing. When, of course, liberals hate the concept of America first because they don't think America deserves it. America's too guilty. America still has too many prices to pay. America first, that's just, that's, that's arrogant and braggadocious and we don't deserve it in their view. And so uh, this piece in the AP, well, who's gonna follow? Meaning Trump is hated, Trump is despised. So Trump putting America first is gonna isolate the country. The uh, writer here is Josh Letterman or Lederman. And I'm not going to share the piece. I just, the guy is just totally off the wall and wrong, as most of them are. They're not even making an effort to understand what Trump actually means with the things that he says. But his voters do. His voters, 80% of Republicans understand it and they love it and they support it. And they don't think America is guilty. And they don't think America has a price to pay. And they don't think the world is better off with America being weakened. And they don't think the world's better off with America being portrayed as a problem in the world. They think just the exact opposite, as Trump does. Manafort calls on DOJ to release his intercepted communications with foreigners. He's calling on the Justice Department to make public any transcripts of any intercepted communications he may have had with foreigners. Mr. Manafort requests that the Department of Justice release any intercepts involving him and any non-American so that interested parties can come to the same conclusion as the DOJ that there is nothing there. You know, the... Th this whole thing, the the um, investigation of Flynn, the investigation into collusion with Russia, the special counsel now, as I mentioned earlier in the programs, people that are deeply experienced in this and knowledgeable, who I know and trust, have come to the conclusion after all of this time with no evidence produced. Not only is there no evidence produced, Comey openly told people Trump was not a target, that Trump Trump was not uh, being pursued. They didn't have any evidence on Trump. They wouldn't go public with that, but Comey had told congressional committees, and he'd even told Trump, but he wouldn't go public with it. Uh, there isn't any evidence, and yet it continues. Now, the Manafort raid and what Mueller is doing, I, I don't think there's any doubt what that's about. I think that is about impeachment and destroying Trump as as best they can. Uh, w when I heard that they're going out 10 years, 10, 11 years in the past looking at Trump's life, I mean, what? He, he's only been running for office since 2015. That's two years. What's 10 years? Well, that's Trump businesses. That's Trump tax returns. That's Trump this, Trump this. I, I have no doubt that they are trying to wipe him out. And they're not going to stop until they have enough they think they can do it. And they're trying to put pressure on people like Manafort to flip. Manafort has been told, by the way, that he's going to be indicted. That's designed to intimidate and frighten him and, and to get him to you know, accept a deal where he would flip for immunity. But it doesn't sound like he's there yet. He's demanding, you release what you found. I got nothing to hide. I didn't do anything. At the top of this pyramid that, that, that has permitted all this to happen is that bogus Trump dossier. Now, whether or not they knew from John Brennan, Obama's CIA guy, James Clapper, the national security guy under Obama, whether they knew at the time that it was fake and made up or whether they accepted it as real, doesn't matter. They have acted on it as the foundation and basis to investigate Trump and his relationship and people with him and relationship to Russia. It has formed the basis. Then they fall back. Well, we've got this. Well, we can't ignore this. Look what this thing says. Yeah, but it's made up. It isn't true. A bunch of Clinton donors paid for the thing. Doesn't matter. It says what it says. And we are responsible intelligence agency people and we must. 
investigate it. It's provided the basis for all of this. And it is, it is bogus. There is a terrific column today by Holman Jenkins in the Wall Street Journal. And I want to share with you relevant pull quotes. Mr. Mueller's recent apparent diversion into Trump business history and or the tax practices of Paul Manafort. It's not just a hallmark of a special counsel fishing expedition. This is a diversion from glaring matters at hand. In other words, this is a cover-up. They're trying to hide. They're trying to get everybody looking at this and not notice what really went on that's criminal. Did FBI Director Comey, as he told a congressional committee, did he intervene in the Hillary email matter in response to likely planted Russian intelligence, setting off the chain reaction that may have shifted votes to the last minute to Trump? You remember this? There was an email that turns out to have been planted by the Russians. Now I'm having a, a, a mental block on what the email is. Something to do with a Loretta Lynch any, anyway, it was it was it was obviously bogus, but Comey chose to believe it at first and uh, intervened in the Hillary email matter in response to this planted email intelligence. And Jenkins says, did this set off a chain reaction that may have gotten votes for Trump? The story of Comey's reliance on possible Russian intelligence disinformation, the email was widely reported to the Washington Post, CNN, and others, and then it was dropped. No, this doesn't mean Russia picked our president, if that's the knowledge Mueller and some in the media think the American people need to be protected from. It means that Mr. Comey and our blundering intelligence agencies, in their efforts to keep Trump out of the White House, may inadvertently have helped him win it. What's been going on ever since smells like a cover-up. Mr. Jenkins writes, remember to Mr. Comey, Mr. Brennan, James Clapper, Trump was a buffoonish, irresponsible candidate. He was also certain to lose to Team Obama. The threat that needed to be contained before Election Day was not Russian meddling. The threat that needed to be contained was the Hillary email investigation. This is such a good point. Back in July 5th, Comey press conference, all through the summer, they never thought Trump was going to win. This is why I've always said that the Russian hack, whatever it was, they never thought it was going to amount to anything. And never did they think Hillary was going to win. They weren't even complaining or that Trump was going to win. They were never even complaining about the Russian hack. They couldn't because they expected Hillary to win. And they didn't want to taint her win by claiming the Russians made it happen. They weren't even talking about what they were doing was trying to make sure Hillary's email thing got buried and got nowhere. And that's what Comey's July 5th press conference was. And it's Jenkins' opinion that all of this, the Manafort stuff and all of it, is a continuing, Mueller, a continuing cover-up of what was really the irregular slash potentially criminal behavior. And that's Hillary, her illegal emails and servers, and all of that money being collected on that server as donations to her. I've got a reason. I'm going to tell you what it is. It isn't me. It isn't me. I couldn't care less. I'm just asking. And now my friend. Oh, the, the email that Comey fell for. Remember this? It was an email that said Loretta Lynch had leaned on the DOJ to drop the Hillary investigation. It was a Russian planted email, supposedly Russian intelligence, that Comey believed when everybody else thought it was bogus. And he acted on it in a way combined with her meeting with Clinton on the tarmac in Phoenix to basically take over the AG job where the Hillary email investigation was concerned. That's what it was. Now, here's Hudson in Normal, Illinois. Hudson, great to have you on the program. Hi. Uh, Rush, to your point about Democrat, uh, Democrats trying to divide groups, uh, this is an observation about dividing males from females. Okay. Um, last night, I watched MSNBC, election night 2016, and I noticed two things to that point. Um, number one, at Hillary's event, when you would see usually see them in groups of four, five, or six. Um, they were generally unattractive, but that's not really my point. 
um, but they were rarely with guys. And if you looked at the women at the Trump event, you frequently saw a woman with a man. And it's, you know, that's, that's quite a stark difference. Um, and then I realized, well, we know that married women uh, vote far more conservatively than single women. And then I remembered what Hillary said uh, last week, that she uh, was blaming men from talking, um, husbands from talking their wives out of voting for her because right. she'd go to jail. Remember that? Or boyfriends. Yeah. So I think this anti-male sentiment is, you know, it's much like immigration. It sounds like, oh, we're really for you, for you poor women. But really it's a voter drive because they know the natural inclination of a woman to be with a man basically eats away at their liberal base. Now, that that's interesting. I'd have to look at a break. I know that you're, you're, that single women vote far more Democrat than married women do, but I don't know that the advantage for Republicans is that great among married women. But your observation that women at the Hillary rally were in groups of five or six with no men and the opposite at the Trump rally that's not hard to explain. Pregnant pause there for the tone. <laughs> new story, it's an ongoing news story of the credit bureau being subject to a massive security breach. We're talking about Equifax. This has started a conversation about how to protect yourself and your online identity. Even though you and I know what the answer is, uh, every time one of these breaches happens, people act like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what do I do? What do I do? We have the answer for you here. You become a LifeLock member. Now, as often as we might have talked about LifeLock, you and I, sometimes it takes one particular event or another to make people get into gear. Sometimes these things happen, and, well, I, I, I'm not, I don't have an account at that store. It's never going to happen to me. I'll, I'll roll a dice. You do that on a lot of things. Uh, disasters hitting your house. I mean, people do this a lot. But something like Equifax, 140 million people affected, and they didn't tell anybody for six or eight weeks, then that kind of gets everybody's attention. This event has shown that you do need to protect yourself online because no one else is going to do it for you. And even the most secure systems can be vulnerable. Now, if a credit bureau in the business of collecting enough personal and financial data on you to give you a credit score, if they can be breached, well, that's an indication that online hackers are more advanced than ever at hacking into these massive databases and getting people's personal data. And they don't want it to help you now, LifeLock is the single best online identity theft protection I know of. I've had it for years. It's not expensive in comparison to the time and money and aggravation that it can save you. LifeLock plans start a less than 10 bucks a month. And remember, no one can prevent all identity theft. No one can monitor every transaction out there at all businesses. But among people who try, there's nobody in LifeLock's league, nobody but LifeLock that you can rely on because they have a team of people that does nothing but fix it. They work with you until it's all fixed if this does happen to you. They call it the restoration team. Go to LifeLock.com right now or call them 800-440-4833. The way use my name as the promo code, you'll get 10% off your LifeLock membership. LifeLock.com or 800 800- 440 4833. The way it works is simple. You give them your social security and credit card numbers, and immediately a pattern of your spending is created by virtue of your behavior. And everything's fine as long as that pattern remains within the established parameters. But if there is a spending hike, like if, if, if your account shows that you're spending crazily when you normally don't, that's when an alert will go out to you. And they'll ask you if it's you doing this. And you reply, yep, it's me. Everything goes away. No, that's not me. Then they get in the gear like you can't believe to track it down. LifeLock.com or 800-440-4833. Here's Michael in Weston, Florida. Welcome, sir. Great to have you here. 
fourth time caller, post Irma, LifeLock member, dittos. Thanks, Team well, Rush. Thank you, sir. Great to have you on the program with us. Very timely commercial. <laughs> you back. <laughs> Uh, Rush, I've got three topics uh, in ascending order of importance, if you uh, would, would like to go over them with me. Well, go for it. One's political. First, second one is uh, making the host look good, and the third one is education. All right. In the political, a couple of weeks ago, you started talking about, you know, the, the uh, media's attack on the Trump voter and uh, maybe trying to cost him voters. But I didn't vote for Trump in the beginning or, uh, you know, in the first election. Well, out of uh, principal objections and image objections and things like that. But if I had known how much it was going to drive the Democrats and the media crazy, I would have voted for him, and I'm going to vote for him next time. Who did you vote for? Not that it matters. I'm just curious. I was a Cruz supporter, and uh, because oh. of, uh, as I say, the issues with Trump, I didn't vote for any presidential candidate. Right, okay. So... But now you would. Now I will. Now you would. Now, is, it, is it just because he irritates the left so much, or is there are there ex are there? Are there uh, no, he's on the right. He's on the right track about a lot of things. His okay. speech yesterday was brilliant. Okay. And uh, and things like that. He's on the right track, and I've never really objected to that. It was just kind of the way he went about it. I right. don't think it's a constitutional method in all of these things. Okay. What's the second point? The second thing is the uh, the uh, parable about a uh, uh, picture worth a thousand words. The Limbaugh letter this this month was worth uh, a whole library. It was great. The the cover of the Limbaugh letter. It says it all. Well, thank you, sir. I you know <laughs> we don't get a lot of calls about the Limbaugh letter, but when we do, everybody on that staff just loves it. Well, they, uh, they deserve some kudos on that. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza is great, and his article was great. Your interview with him. And the, uh, the facts, I had just gotten off the phone with my sister about four hours prior discussing um, uh, single-payer health care and the lib lies that uh, was in that section. I pulled it out and mailed it to her. Thank you. So it was very timely. Thank you, sir. That's how word spreads. The Limbaugh letter is 16. You, people don't know how difficult that is because look at 15 hours a week here. On the radio, that is that is then reproduced on the website, and yet here's this 16-page monthly publication that's now gone digital. It, what do you do to put things in it that that haven't been said? It's a it's a monthly challenge, and the people that put that together are excellent at it. Yes, I agree. It's a good it's a good magazine. And of course, they follow my example. That's why it, it's it's great. And but really, in, in all candor, it is it is 15 hours a week. What is there not said? It turns out a lot. And uh, the, the the newsletter is the repository for us. So I'm I'm really flattered that you mentioned that. Well, whoever had the cover, that was that was brilliant. Well, now, the, you uh, you said Dinesh. That's two issues ago. Which no, co which the, cover are you talking about? The cover of the Republican elephant refusing to take the shovel. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen the original. <laughs> the original. <laughs> Brian, hold that back up again. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's going to bring it in. Uh, yeah, this this was... <laughs> the, the donkey is buried. Let me hold it up on this side. And Brian can... Uh, you brought it in. We can switch on the side camera so people get a shot at this. Well, let me add to that, Rush, if I may. Go right ahead. Well, I'm just saying that your observation about what the Republicans are doing to themselves is spot on. I didn't vote for Trump out of principle. I'm sure as heck not going to vote for a Republican like McConnell or Ryan out of principle either. They better get their act in gear. Uh, so you're not happy with them? Uh, that's an understatement, and I won't say more than that. All right. Well, you have been uh, you've been you've been exceptional here today. Well, Michael. I got one third point that's well, important. Oh, I thought that was the third point. Uh, no, McConnell no, and well, okay, what's the third point? Last point: education. And you've talked about it on the air, you've talked about it in the magazine, but the educational system in the country, the university system and stuff, is a disgrace. I give you, as, an, as a graduate thereof, the University of Missouri, oh. and, uh, and I'm a show-me-state kind of guy, but uh, it's disgusting. But they, anyway, I know you support Hillsdale College, and I do too, and I would just had the idea that it might be great. I know you do two marathons already as far as for the... Uh, for the uh, leukemia and for the um, for the um, first responders and Marine Corps, but I really don't think your audience would mind too much if it was going to a worthy cause to have a third tele uh, radiothon for education to support institutions like Hillsdale and their Barney Charter Schools. Right. 
I think that'd be great. And I'd challenge you that if you put it in place, I will match you dollar for dollar all the way up to $500. How about that? <laughs> okay. Well, we'll put that in a hopper. Uh, you know, about the radiothons, we have given them a break for a while, and I'll tell you why. We're coming up on 30 years, and for 28, 29, I think every year, we said they came to every year. Um, I have, I have, well, there's no other way to put it. I've asked the audience to donate to something. And I got to the point where uh, I said, I'm, I'm uncomfortable continuing to ask. Uh, those that have contributed and want to continue, they know that leukemia is there. And if they want to continue to give, they can. But it's just, it's, it, it comes under the umbrella that I just do not ever want to look at this audience as first a bunch of customers or donors or what have you. And I, and I, and I don't want to set this up to where uh, this audience is judged on how charitable it is because financial pressures are extensive out there. We've, we've gone through a stagnant economy for eight years with Obama, and even before that it wasn't going great guns. And I just thought the audience needed a break, even though it's all voluntary, uh, just needed a break from being asked or cajoled or whatever to uh, to donate. Uh, not saying that we won't return to it, but uh, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not like Jerry Lewis said that that the muscular dystrophy that 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 was a whole different thing. With him, he just got tired of. Or they they wanted to change directions. And this was just an active decision I made. Uh, with with all of you in mind, and after so many years that you know, I thought we had pretty much got what we were going to get, even though the audience is growing. Uh, maybe I misjudged it, but that was my thinking on it. You, know, you could always resume it. Uh, what do you mean? A lot of pushback. You think? You think? Oh, Snurdly thinks I'm going to push back to uh, to reconstitute these things. Well, I mean, we'll see. Uh, I'm very tough to reach, so even if there is pushback, I may not even be able to... Uh, let me make sure here. Single. I don't find women anywhere here in the description as a quick... But here's the numbers. Clinton married couples, 59%. I'm sorry. Uh... I hate charts. I cannot translate these names. Married couples were 59% of the electorate. Trump got 52% of the married vote, and Hillary got 44%. Unmarried, 41% of the uh, electorate. Hillary got 55% of the unmarried vote, and 37% went to Trump. So there's something to it. Now, uh, 2016 exit poll found Trump won among married voters, 52 percent lost decisively among unmarried. The 26-point marriage gap of the 2016 electorate is large. In fact, it surpasses the 24-point gender gap found in the CNN exit poll. Uh, but this does not—it it doesn't say it's women. It's just whether people are married or not. So— uh, the male-female break. If it's here, it's a chart, and I can't tell. The, the word woman is nowhere anywhere on this page. So, but the point, the caller had a point that unmarried women tend to vote Democrat, married women te tend to vote Republican, and it, apparently it's born out there. Uh, we've been talking about college, chilling studies showing how hostile college students are toward free speech. 20% of them believe that violence is called for against people who say things you disagree with, 20 percent. Now, these are people going to college. It's cost a lot of money. Their parents have either borrowed a lot of money or spending a lot of money. Uh, students themselves are going in debt just inordinately for an education featuring stuff like that. But still, the money is the money. The debt's the debt. And the price tag that is attached to a college degree looks different than it used to. It's much larger. Four figures is turned into five figures, the debt. 
and total expense for an undergraduate degree can be six figures. If you go on to get a master's degree, med school, law school, that can be really expensive for a student, not to mention the parents who often foot the bill. We have a sponsor that wants to help as many people as they can with this. It's called SoFi, S-O-F-I, SoFi.com, and they try to help with all this. Now, to many parents, it's the single source of tuition financing that appears competitively priced when compared to the federal loan choices that are often suggested by colleges. That's what SoFi does is try to improve on that. They're a financial services company that have... they invested in helping parents get a better interest rate, an overall better low, uh, loan, flexible terms. SoFi refers to this as a parent plus loan. Whether it's a new loan or you choose to refinance with SoFi, they work with parents in every case. And, and remember, their, their purpose here is to help you however they can get a lower monthly payment, usually by lowering the interest rate. If you're a parent helping your child get through college, SoFi can help. The online application process is fast and easy, and you can find what your new rate would be in two minutes or less. But you have to be uh, accepted, and they have a criteria. They're looking to invest in solid people who have uh, a, a commitment to working after college and so forth, the ability to repay it essentially. You finish the application process, takes a few steps. It's all done without any fees at this stage. The website, SoFi.com, go online, SoFi.com slash parent, and get started to see if they can help. They may be able to lower your overall exposure on a student loan.